Hey, I'm Pastor Andrew Ebanks, lead pastor at the Agape Family Worship Center. We pray this message and resource will stir up your affections for Jesus and encourage you in your calling. Use this resource in conjunction with you belonging to a local church that is helping to shape and shepherd you in Jesus Christ. If these resources bless you, would you consider giving back to us here at Agape? You can visit us at agapekman.ky slash giving to see how you can do that. Again, we pray this blesses, encourages, and grows you in your love for Jesus Christ. have begun a series where we've been talking about family focus and we've been looking and, and just talking about things that impact and influence our families and the things that that really we all face in our families regardless of sort of where we are on that spectrum and, and so last week as we as we just kind of talked about relationships and, and what those things are like and, and, and how we walk with God in these seasons and times of our lives and, and, and I'm excited as we talk today because as we talk today, we're really going to be getting a tune-up on our relationships. Just as our cars need tune-ups, I believe, our, 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 so do our relationships. Our relationships need tune-ups as well. And so today, you know, uh, there's so many relationships that are just hurting for various reasons. There's so many relationships that have just gone through so much as a result of so many of the things happening in the world. And then, let's just be honest, raising families are hard. Having a family is hard. I mean, I don't know a single person that has siblings or parents or kids or a husband or a wife that there's not some conflict that at some point in time has not taken place. And things have just really been sort of amped up over the last couple of years given the COVID situation and how things have been and, and it's just been kind of tough for a lot of families. And so that's why this morning we're, we're, we're taking the time to talk about these things, to talk about family. And so today we're gonna be talking about closing the gap closing the gap. And we're going to be looking at some principles today that can be applied to relationships in general, but we're going to be specifically talking about marriage. But it is applicable in many different forms of life, regardless of the relationship that you have. And so this will be applicable to you whether or not you're married or not. We're going to, so we're going to talk about some marriage. We're going to, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, sex and a, and a few other things. And so buckle up, people, because uh, we're, we're getting going this morning. So be prepared. So let's, uh, let's specifically talk this morning a little bit about the foundational marriage scripture. This is where basically everything regarding marriage is based off of starting in scripture, and it's found in Genesis chapter 2, and uh, we're going to read there this morning that foundational marriage scripture that, that, that really comes uh, first in line with, with, with the way that scripture lays out uh, the timeline and history and so forth. And, and let me just say that, that all the notes are available in the Agape app, so go ahead and, 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 and you can pull those up and, and read those uh, this morning and follow along in there. But Genesis chapter 2, verse 22 to 24, and this is the foundational marriage scripture. This is where all 
all talk of marriage that comes after this in scripture is based off of this scripture right here. And it says, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called a woman because she was taken out of man. Let me pause here for just a second. What we see happening here is God has created everything. He's created the entire universe, the entire cosmos, and he brings Adam into the garden after he's made him. Uh, He formed him out of the dust of the ground, and then God tells Adam to look among all creation, everything that God has made, and see if he can find a suitable helper. And Adam looks at all the animals and everything around, and he says, no, God, I don't don't see anything, anybody, you know, there's just like, this isn't going to work for me. And, uh, and so what God does is Adam goes to sleep. God takes Adam and he does surgery on him basically. And so God takes a rib from Adam and he molds Eve and makes Eve from Adam's rib. And so this is important because God didn't make Eve from the dust of the ground like he made Adam from. God made Eve from the same substance. Everything that Adam was, Eve is also. Because God didn't take a slightly different type of dirt or a slightly different area of dirt or any of those kinds of things. No, no, God just took what Adam was already made from and formed Eve from the very same thing. She's made of the same substance. I've heard it said before that that God didn't make Eve from a bone in Adam's foot so that she could be trampled on or dominated by Adam. That that he didn't make Eve from a bone from Adam's head because she would not be superior to Adam. Although my wife has recently uh, been reading her Bible and found a scripture that says that a noble wife is her husband's crown. And so she said, you might be the head, sweetheart, but I am the crown. And I hope you remember that. And, uh, and so praise God for that. Uh, but he took Eve and he made her from a rib from his side. And this is important because he made Eve from his side, from beside him, so that she could be beside him as a partner, as an equal, to walk through Life. The Bible, when it talks about husbands and wives being joint heirs together in salvation, in Christ. And so this, this is foundational to understanding. That, 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 and listen, this, this has been taught wrong in so many different ways because it's been taught over the years that men are superior to women. And, and to be honest with you, you can't read Scripture and honestly come to that conclusion if you read it correctly. You just can't. Men are not superior to women. God made Eve from Adam's side. Yes, the husband is the head of the home, but that doesn't mean that he is there to dominate. Christ was equal to the Father and the Spirit, yet he submitted himself to the Father. Yet he's equal to him. So it cannot be that, that, that somehow if God is in perfect equality with himself and Jesus submitted himself to the Father, it cannot mean that the Father is greater than the Son or the Spirit is greater than the Father or the Son. And so the same applies here. Husbands and wives join together in in, in unity, in salvation, and in life. And so verse 24 continues, and it says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And so this is where this whole principle and idea of marriage comes from, this scripture here in Genesis chapter 2. And what it is saying here is that the husband and the wife will be united physically, spiritually, and financially even. I mean, these are all areas of our lives where where we will come into a, a unity with one another. I mean, this is important. But contrary to popular belief, marriage does not mean happily ever after. Because the hard work doesn't start until after you get married. Marriage is a lot of work. Can I get an amen from the married people in the building? <laughs> it doesn't mean you don't have a great marriage, but it's a lot of work. 
A lot of, you know, I used to hear people say, oh, you, you did it. You're living the dream. You're married now. You're, you're in a relationship now. You, you've done it. That's not, where, you know, like, praise God for the beautiful wedding day. But the, the hard work doesn't start till after that. And the reality is that if we're not careful, if we're not watching, if we're not marriage with tenderness, we will then drift somewhere that we didn't intend to be, and somewhere along the way, we will stop pursuing our spouse the way that we should be. We'll stop pursuing them in love the way that we, that we should have. Somewhere along the line, maybe we get relationally lazy, and we stop doing the things that we know that we, we should do. You see, think, think about that in any other aspect of life. Just, just think about that in, in, every, in, in any other area of your life and see if that works. Your business. You know what? I don't feel like doing any work for the next six months. You know, I'm just going to kind of just give it all to you. And I'm just going to relax. I mean, how's that going to work out for your business? Maybe, maybe you're a business owner. You, you know that's not going to work. Maybe, maybe you work for somebody else. You know that you can't just sit by your desk and just be like, man, six months is going to go by. And fl- I'm just going to, I'm going to come into work. I'm going to sit here and I'm not going to hit a lick. Like I'm going to read whatever book I want to read. I'm going to watch videos on YouTube. I'm, I'm, I'm going to make all the personal phone calls I want. Like I'm just not doing anything. It's not going to work. And so if this is the reality, I mean, take your body for instance. Man, I'm just going to be lazy. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to work out. I'm not going to eat right. I'm going to eat, you know, 20 Snickers bars in a day. Eat the whole box of donuts. I'm just lazy. I'm not going to get up and walk. I'm going to watch TV for the next three weeks. Then is it any surprise that, that, that we're, we're unhealthy and we're, we're having health issues as a result of making those lazy choices? Fast food is fast, but the effects of it are not, <laughs> not so easy to get rid of. It's not so, quite so fixed of it, isn't it? Some of us have been battling with that for a long time. Your yard, I mean, you know, if you, if you look at your yard and, you're, and there's weeds growing everywhere, I'll get to those next week. I mean, your yard is just going to look like a mess. The reality is, is that in no other area of our lives, in parenting, in our marriage, or anything, just, just pick an area, we can't be relationally lazy, so, so why do we think that'll work with our marriages and with our relationships? It doesn't work that way, because if we, if we do that, if we take that approach, then let me tell you what will happen really quickly. The, the proverbial grass will be greener on the other side. And then we start looking, why, man, look at how nice your yard looks. Look at how wonderful and green your yard is. Man, I wish I had your yard. I wish I had your marriage. I wish I was married to a husband like yours or a wife like yours, because if I had that, I wouldn't have to put up with this. And the grass starts looking greener on the other side. And let me just tell you, if the grass starts looking greener on the other side, start watering your own grass. If it starts looking greener on the other side, it's time to start watering your own grass. Because the reality of life is, is that we like things that are ready-made and brought to us. We want a prepackaged relationship that we don't have to work, work at and work for. It's one of the reasons why, and this is like the most common answer that, that pr- pretty much any, anybody will get. Just ask a couple, why, why do you want to get married? Oh, we love each other and we like all the same stuff and we're just, we just fit so good together. You rarely ever hear anybody, if, if, if at all, hear someone say, man, they drive me up the wall and, and I just can't wait to marry them. No, we want to marry somebody that we, fit, we feel fits into our lives and be in relationships with people that we feel like we're on the same page. Like we, we can read each other's minds, which is an impossible thing, by the way. No matter how much you get it right, I promise you, they cannot read your mind. But the reality is, is that, that that's how we want it to be. And we've idealized it and, we, and we've created, and, and then it's fine to have an ideal of what you want something to be like, but when reality doesn't match the ideal and the ideal is your end up happening is, is that then you're living in a false reality because you've created a relationship that doesn't exist. Matter of fact, you've created a person who doesn't exist. If that person, that friend even, who's like, I thought they were this way, but, but they were this way. 
And now the disappointment sets in and we're, we're, we're hurt as a result of it. And so this word here, when we come back to verse 24, let's come back to the scripture. He says that a husband shall hold fast to his wife. This, this word hold fast or united or, or joined together in, in some translations, depending on, on how you read it, in the original language, uh, we, we're going to, uh, this, this word here is the word debak, debak. And it, what it means is simply this, to cling, to adhere, to stick to, to catch by pursuit, to pursue hard with affection and devotion, and it's not a trivial pursuit, it's an intentional pursuit. So what it's saying here, when it, when it says that the husband shall hold fast to his wife, he shall cling fast to his wife, he shall, he shall be united with his wife, that it's an intentional pursuit on the part of man closely knitted with and united with his wife in relationship. It's intentionally happening. It's not something that just happens by mistake or by accident. It happens on purpose. And so what happens here is that he's, when, 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 when uh, Scripture is telling us here, when God is speaking here, that a man shall hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh, it's really a command. It's not a suggestion. It's a command that as a husband, that, that that's what we will do. We will hold fast, cling to, pursue consistently, Pursue hard after her, not just, notice what he said, his wife. Not the beautiful single girl that, that, that we like. Meaning that once you're married to her, you still have an obligation to pursue her. It's not just before you get married, it's after you get married as well. And so this idea here of being united together is the idea of I'm going to chase after you forever. I'm going to pursue you all the days of your life and all the days of my life. And what, what happens here is that, is that sometimes we hear couples, you know, talk about this and we say, well, you know, we ran out of love. Well, not love is like selling your car because you ran out of gas. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. See, see, none of us think that way, right? If our car runs out of gas, what do we do? You go fill it back up because that's what your car needs. It needs to be refilled. And you can't sustain love if you're not refilling it. If you ran out of love, then it's time to refill that tank. If you ran out of love, then it's time to refill that love in your relationship because that is important. So, so actually next week, that's what we're going to be spending time talking about is, is how to fill our lives and our relationships with others, not just our spouses, but with others with love. That's important to understand because you can't sustain a marriage on the love that you had on your wedding day. There's a lot of people who feel that way, who feel like, man, you know, we, we, we were so in love when we got married. Well, did you refill the tank along the way? Did you refill the tank as you went along? Or did you simply just expect that, that the love that you had on that day will be the love that will take you forever? See, we've got to make a continual commitment to this, to be in the pursuit of one another and in love for each other. This is important. We've got to continually fill it. So let me show you some instances of this word debak in Scripture. And, 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 and it's kind of like saying it kind of Caribbean style, you know, like the word the back, like the back, like your back. It's kind of like saying the back, the back of the yard. Like that kind of way. That's how you, that's how you would pronounce it. So there's, there's two other, there's, there's actually more than this, but, but there's two instances of scripture I want to point out to you. First one is found in Psalm 63 verse 8, and it says, my soul clings to you. This is a psalm where, where David's talking about his relationship with God, and he's saying, my soul debak, my soul clings, pursues, is holding on to you, is united with you, and it's, 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 it's clinging to you for dear life, God. I need you, Lord. That's what David is saying here. And then in Judges chapter 20, verse 45, it says, and they were pursued hard to get him, or to, to get him. Now, this is actually describing a battle. 
And what it's actually describing is, is that they were in a fight, and as they were fighting, they began to win the fight, and so the enemy began to run from them, and they pursued the enemy hard, chasing them from where they were all the way to get them, and I, that's actually kind of funny. They pursued them until they got them. Get them. Get them, boy. Sorry. My brain. That was a terrible dad joke. I apologize. I just thought of it. Anyway, they pursued them hard. They were chasing after them to kill them, to destroy them. Now, now this is the opposite of what we want to do in our marriages, though. We want to pursue hard after, but we're not pursuing to destroy. We're not pursuing to, to win the fight or win the argument or any of these things. What we're doing is we are pursuing the person hard. So we're saying, I want to be in relationship with you. I, I want to cling to you. I want to be near you. I want to hold on to you. I want to have relationship with you. And, and so our spouses, just like here, when they pursued them to get them so that they could kill them, so too do we pursue our spouses as the prize to be won. And so we say, I love you. I'm pursuing you. I'm chasing after you because I want to be united with you. This is that word, debak. There's also another instance in Scripture that, that I'm not sure if the word is actually used, but it's, a, it's an interesting example of it. Many of us know the story of, of Jacob and Rachel and Leah, the, uh, the, the love triangle there that, that was quite interesting. Jacob saw this girl by the name of Rachel, and he absolutely fell in love. The Bible says that, that, that Rachel was beautiful in both form and appearance, meaning that basically she had a nice body and a beautiful face. She was just everything to behold and look at. And so Jacob, he sees her and he's smitten and he's like, oh dear Lord, this is the most beautiful woman to walk on the face of the earth. And so Jacob goes to her father Laban and he says to him, I wanna marry one of your daughters, Rachel specifically, because mm, I, I like her. And so he says, I'll tell you what, I'll let you marry my daughter if you work for me for seven years. And so he goes, great, I'll do it. So Jacob works for Laban for seven years. On the day that he's supposed to marry her, what happens is, is that, that Jacob, instead of, instead of sending Rachel into the room, sends Leah into the room, and instead Jacob unites with Leah rather than uniting with Rachel. And when Jacob walks out of the room after realizing what had happened, he goes, what, what was this about? Why'd you trick me? Like, like, like now I'm, I'm married to, to Leah. I didn't want to marry Leah. And, and, and that might sound bad, but the Bible describes Leah as being tender-eyed. Now, there's, I'll be honest with you. Scholars are a bit torn on what this means. There's a bit torn on what this means, and you might think that it's not that important, but, but Rachel is described in the sense of being beautiful in form and appearance. Leah is, being, is, is described as being tender-eyed, meaning that some scholars say that maybe there were tenderness in her eyes, but basically what most scholars agree on is that there seemed to be no spark in her eyes. It's basically a nice way of saying, or it's an insulting compliment. So it's like the equivalent of, of, of when us as Caribbean people meet other people, you get fat though. That was supposed to be hello. It's an insulting compliment. And so what it actually means is that she was tender-eyed, kind of like in, for those of you who are familiar with this phrase, like in, in the south in certain parts of the, of the U.S., they'll say, bless your dear sweet little heart. That means you're a dumb dumb. What this means is she was ugly. And so he's upset because now rather than the beautiful daughter he expected to marry, he ended up with the ugly sister. And he is vexed. And he goes and he, and he says, Laban, I didn't, I didn't want to marry this one. I worked seven years and you tricked me, which is interesting because Jacob actually tricked his father into giving him his brother's blessing. And now the same things happened to him. And so Laban comes along, he says, well, it's tradition that the oldest should get married first. And we couldn't let the oldest one not get married, so, so you had to marry her first. I'll tell you what, if you want to marry Rachel, work seven more years for me, and I'll give you Rachel. So Jacob worked 14 years 
just to get the woman that he loved, just to pursue the woman that he wanted. Now, now I'm not encouraging a long engagement. I'm, I'm sure if you wait 14 years, she's probably not going to stick around that long. But what I'm saying is, is that Jacob had a passion to pursue her. He chased after her for 14 years because, because she was just so incredible and amazing and worth it to him that for 14 years he slaved, he worked himself to death so that he could marry the woman of his dreams. And so too should we do that for our spouses. So too should we pursue one another in that way. See, a lot of times our good intentions are not translated into the right actions. We mean well. We have good intentions. We, we, we didn't mean to do something wrong. We, we had good intentions about it, but still they don't necessarily translate into the right actions. And this is important for us. So I want to talk and give you this morning three ways to close the gap in your marriage. Like I said, I think these apply to, to more than just our marriage and our relationships. I think this applies a, across the board in many ways. But, uh, but we're, we're, again, we're talking and focusing primarily on, on marriage, but you'll, you'll get something out of this even if you're not married. So when you think something good, say it. That's the first thing. When you think something good, say it. Don't keep it to yourself. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 13, it says, but exhort one another every day as long as it is called today. What does that mean? That we have a responsibility to encourage one another daily. So if you're married, guess what? You have a responsibility to your spouse every single day to say something nice to them, as hard as that might be for you. You, 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 you have a responsibility based on Scripture to say something nice, at least one thing, to exhort and lift up and encourage and say, hey, you look nice today. I like those shoes. I like, I like your hair. I like that outfit. I like what you're wearing. You, you just, just, just exhort. Just say something nice to each other. If you think something nice or something good, then say it. Do it daily. Say it out loud. Don't just think it. You know, you ever had that moment where, where it's like you, you thought you said something? You said it in your head, but you didn't say it with your mouth? Let it translate from your head into your, into your mouth and come out of your mouth and, and so that you can say it to your, your spouse. That's important. Because sometimes what happens is we don't encourage one another. We don't, we don't lift each other up. And then what ends up happening is, is that we end up feeling like, well, I, I got all dressed up and they didn't say anything. I got my hair cut, and they didn't say anything. I got my hair done. I got my nails done. I did my feet. Uh, I, I bought this new, new suit, this new outfit. They didn't say anything. They, they, they're not paying attention to me. And they noticed, but they didn't say anything. When you see something or you think something nice, say it. This is important. Man, let me speak to you for just a second, and then I'll, ladies, I'll come to you after. Men, pursue her with words of affection. Pursue her with words of affection. And let me add a clause on here that's important. That aren't going anywhere else. Words that aren't leading to anything else. Use non-sexual words to, to communicate with her. And I know sometimes for us as men that that's hard. But to, to actually say something, what I mean here is to say something nice without expecting something else. So we, we, we say, you look beautiful, you look nice, you look, you look gorgeous, you're as beautiful as the sky is blue, you know, whatever it is you want to throw out there, and not expect to get something else in return. We can compliment and pursue her with words of affection, I love you, I, I, I'm thinking about you, I miss you, not going, yeah, I'm going to say, oh, listen, then, man, later on tonight, whoo, yeah. Because men, if we're being honest, we can make anything sexual. We can make anything sexual. Would you go to the kitchen and, and, and get me a spoon so I can stir this up? Oh, I'll stir something up for you. We know that we, we, know we can make anything sexual. And so the important part, listen, I'm going to just be honest with you this morning. You all know me, I'm going to be honest. 
We can make anything sexual, and it's important that we don't just think sexually, but that we also think, how can I pursue her with words of affection just because I want to say something nice? Just because I want to exhort and encourage and say something good to her. That's it. It doesn't have to have anything else. You know, I, I'll be honest with you. I, anybody that, 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 that spends any time around me knows that I tell my wife that I love her a lot. And anybody that spends a lot of time around her knows that she tells me that she loves me a lot. I would venture to say that on average we probably tell each other we love each other like 10 times a day. Like I'm not even exaggerating there. We talk so much and we tell each other we love each other so much. You're about to see each other. Why are you telling each other you love each other when you can see each other in five minutes? You just got off the phone and you told her five, you loved her five minutes ago and you're telling her you love her again. Yeah, it's important that she knows that I love her. I tell my wife I love her all the time. People get frustrated with that. Doesn't stop me, doesn't bother me at all. I'm going to still tell her I love her. But one of the things that over the course of our marriage that I've learned that, 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 that's really helpful is, is not just to tell her that, that I love her, but to tell her why I love her. I love you because... And then just say whatever it is those things are. You know, I, I love you because you're, so, you're such a wonderful mother. I love you. You're such a great wife. You know, whatever it is, just to encourage her, not just with the I love you, but the why behind I love you. And all of a sudden, the, I mean, you can just see Emily's eyes just, just light up when it's like, like you just exhort and encourage her. And she's like, I needed to hear that today. And a lot of you ladies right now, you're shaking your head because you know what I'm talking about. That you feel like you, you need that. that. That because behind why I love you, it just, it means something more to you. But ladies, let me speak to you now. <laughs> Amen, brother. Amen. <laughs> ladies, or men, as we pursue her with words of affection, lady, ladies, pursue him with words of affirmation. This is important. That we pursue him with words of affirmation. That you praise actions that you want him to repeat. So if he does a good job with it, tell him he did a good job with it. Because you want him to do it again. See, a lot of, a lot of what I hear sometimes from, from couples is, you know, I, I want him to be my spiritual leader. I want him to be the spiritual leader in the home. And I'll be honest with you, a lot of men get confused by that. Because they're like, what does that even mean? And a lot of men struggle with that because, ladies, I will tell you, if you come home with the latest Beth Moore Bible study and you're like, hey, let's do this together, the answer is going to be no. I mean, just being honest. He's not going to get excited about that. He's not going to be excited to do the latest Bible study that Beth Moore put out on, on, on marriage. That, that's not going to be what excites him. But maybe he, he gets up on a Sunday morning and he says, let's go to church. Maybe he says, let's pray. And that is important as well. Also, as you affirm and encourage that, that becomes an important part of the relationship. And so what happens a lot of times is, is that we will look at them and we will say to our spouse, I wish you were more like, I wish you did more of, and, and it comes across as complaining, but if we instead shift the focus of it from the negative to the positive and say, I want to affirm this, and say, rather than focusing on what you didn't do, I'm gonna focus on what you did do. And so you did this and I, and I like that, thank you so much for doing that. That affirmation, men, their, their, their brain is just like, yeah, I did something good, praise God. He, he earned brownie points there, and he feels good. And what it says to them is, she believes in me. She believes in me. She, she believes that I can do this. She, she thinks that, that because I did this, it's great. And I feel great because I know that, that, that she enjoyed that, that she liked the fact that I carried the garbage out without even being asked to take it out. You might think that that sounds simple and small, but when you come back in the house and Thank you so much for taking out the garbage. Oh, you're welcome. Now all of a sudden there's this affirmation there. It's like, I want to do this because I kind of feel like I'm, 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 I'm almost like saying like, hey, like, good job, boy, good job. Here's a treat. But I'm being serious. It works. You know, to be honest with you, one of the things that, that, that's interesting about Emily and I's relationship is that Emily has kind of believed me into becoming the husband that I am today. 
I, I wasn't always the way that I am now, and, and, I, and I know I still got a, a, a lot of work to do, but, but the man that I've become today, I've become because Emily has sort of believed me into becoming that man. And, and she, she'll come along and she'll say things to me and she'll affirm me in certain areas and, and she'll talk to me about certain things. And, and as a result of that, I have opened my heart to that and, 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 and asked the Lord to lead me and guide me and to, to direct me. And, and I've become more of the man that she wants me to be than I was when we first got married. And so when she looks at me now and she sees me, she, she sees me as being very different. Uh, the, the best way I can say it is sort of the way that, that, that I've heard my mother and my father talk about it growing up. My parents, my, my mother would say all the time growing up, she's like, I trained your father to be the man I wanted. And my father would come along and says, your mother trained me well. And, and, and all we could do was laugh. Because the reality was is that that's what we do, don't we? We, we train our spouses to, to do certain things that we like. And so this is why sometimes when people get remarried, they struggle because their first spouse did it a certain way that they liked and the new one is doing something else. And then they're like, they're like why are you doing it that way? And that's not how you do it. But this is how I've always done No, that's not how you do it. Because they train the first spouse a certain way. And so, so the reality is, is that we teach them, and when we believe, ladies, when you believe in your man, you're, you're helping him become more of what you actually believe him to be, rather than criticizing him and nagging him, because that's what happens a lot of times. Men, whether it's true or not, men will sometimes go, but why is she nagging me? Why is she criticizing me all the time? And they feel that way. And so if you affirm them, then they don't feel that way. And so this, bec- this, this helps. So, so let me give you an example. For instance, you know, cr- Christmas time. Christmas, Christmas is coming up, ladies. I, I'm, a, I'm giving you a few months head start. Christmas time, he prays over the meal. And you say, sweetheart, would you, would you bless the meal for us? And maybe it is the worst possible prayer you have ever heard in your life. All right, uh, Lord, uh, bless the food. Bless the beef and the chicken and the rice and beans and, uh, and the family. Thank you, Lord. Amen. You're probably sitting there thinking to yourself, that's, that's it? That, that's all? But don't tell him that. Because guess what? He'll never pray again. Oh, well, you want me to pray next time? Oh, you, you, you didn't like my prayer the last time, and you want to ask me to pray for the food and embarrass me for the whole family again? Some of you chuckling because it happened. But instead, rather than doing that, you get real close to him, and you whisper in his ear, and you say, sweetheart, that prayer was wonderful. <laughs> Don't lie to him, but, you know. I was one, encourage him, affirm him. I'm so proud of you for praying. And you know what? I, 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 felt, I felt the presence of the Lord in the room. And, I, and I, I'm just so thankful to God that you prayed that prayer today. Ladies, I promise you, he'll be praying in tongues by Friday. I, I promise. You affirm him, he'll do it. I promise. I, I'll be honest with you. The, the, the most vulnerable, I, I, I'm coming up on one of my most vulnerable moments. My most vulnerable moments are after I preach. I'll be honest with you. After preaching, I, I'm, always, I, I'm always vulnerable, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm running a million things through my head. Like, man, how was that sermon? How did it go? Like, 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 Emily can attest to this. Every single Sunday after church, babe, how was my sermon? How did it go? How did I do? You know, and, and, and you know what? Every single Sunday she comes and she'll say, that was a good point. I like when you said, you said this, and that was an excellent point. Or, or you know, you, 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 when you pointed that out, I never thought of it in that way before. That was incredible for you to share that. And, 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 and I can't believe you told that story, Andrew. Dear Lord, I was sitting on the edge of my seat the whole time. Well, why in God's name are you sharing that right now? That's too much information. Or... The other one that really gets me good. Sorry, sweetheart, I'm going to embarrass you here in a second. She goes, I was just watching you preach, and I'm going, that's my man. That makes me feel good. 
Trust me, like I get up here ready to preach some Sundays. I'm like, yeah, I'm her mind. <laughs> Praise God. And it blesses me. It affirms me. Like, like I can tell you, there's so many days that I come here and, 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 and I'm going through something. And it's not because I don't love preaching or whatever, but I'm struggling with something in my mind. I'm like, God, like I can't, like how am I supposed to focus on what am I supposed to do? And my wife just affirms and encourages me, babe, you're going to do this. God's going to be with you. You, you. I know you can. I'm so proud. And I get up here and I share the word of God all because my wife affirmed and blessed me before I did it. Trust me, that, that is powerful. I could charge hell with a water gun after that. I mean, it, it is just, it, I am just so blessed by that. Affirm your man, ladies. Trust me, it goes a long way because I just need to know that the person who knows me the best, the person who, who loves me, believes in me the most. And when I know that, that makes all the difference in the world for me. It really, really does. Lady, let me just tell you something. You have the power in your mouth to affirm him and build him up or to criticize and break him down. You really do. You really do. So, so man, she wants to know this. Do you love me today? Not last week, not yesterday, not when we first got married. Do you love me today? Find a way to show her today. You don't have to spend money and buy her flowers. She just wants to know, do you love me today? And ladies, he wants to know, do you believe in me today? Do you believe in me today? Do you believe in my dreams? Do you believe in my hopes? Do you believe in my vision? Do, do, you, do you believe in the man that I am today? That's important. Secondly, when you think something special, do it. When you think something special, do what James chapter 4 verse 17 says, so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. So stop sinning by not doing what you know you should do. This is important. James says if you know the right thing to do and you don't do it, he says to you it is sin. And for each of us today, we, we, there's, there's something special maybe that you thought of. Do it. Just do it and bless them. Close the gap between your good intentions and your right actions. Be a blessing to your spouse. If you want to know how to be a blessing, this is an easy way to do it. Just think of something special and just do it. You know, particularly men, you know, we get frustrated. What do you want to eat? And all the men went, mmm. Because we know, well, I don't know. Well, you want this? No. You want that? No. You want other thing? No. All right, well, wh whatever you want to eat. Well, I want that. No, I don't want that either. You know, just, just surprise her sometimes. And just be like, you know what? I'm taking you to, and then you just take her. And you go. You, you just, you thought of something nice and special, just, just do it. Because sometimes it's not even about where you go. It's just the fact that you thought to do something that makes all the difference in the world. You see, I, it's, it's, it's actually kind of funny because one of the things that I, that I find when you talk to so many couples is like the thing that, that, that wives oftentimes find it so incredible and amazing and, 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 and just, just really just gets them really excited about, about their husbands is when they do things that they don't normally do, like wash the dishes. I can't tell you how many times like, that, like couples have come to me, I just love when he washes the dishes. It's washing dishes. Like it's just washing dishes. Why, is, why are you so excited? Yes, because he doesn't normally wash the dishes. And the fact that he's washing dishes I, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm so blessed by the fact that he was washing the dishes. And, and so you look at this and you're like, like, all right, well, why are you so excited about washing dishes? Because he's being a blessing to me. When you just do it, you're being a blessing. And, and when you think of something special, just do it. See, one of the things that happens a lot of times in our lives that I think a lot of us struggle with and suffer from we struggle with it and we suffer from it, is overscheduling. We schedule every other part of our lives. We schedule our work, 
We schedule what time we're going to go to bed. We schedule what time we want to eat. We schedule what time lunch is. We schedule when the kids need to go to school or when the kids need to go to bed. And when this happens, that happens, and the other thing. But what we don't schedule is intimacy. We just kind of leave intimacy to happen whenever it happens. And the reality is, is if we leave intimacy up to our schedules, there will never be enough time for intimacy because we never schedule it in. And it always happens on just this sort of just kind of willy-nilly, just sort of happen kind of way. And the reason why so many couples feel like they don't have intimacy or prioritized intimacy in their relationship has to do with the fact that, well, they don't schedule it in. But the reality of the situation is, is that if we want to prioritize intimacy, one of the first things that we need to do is schedule intimacy into our relationship. I'm serious. Choose, choose a day of the week and just say, you know what, this is going to be our night. Friday night's going to be date light. Tuesday night's going to be Taco Tuesday, and we're going to sit down on Tuesday night, and we're just going to eat tacos. We're going to put the kids to bed early, and we're going to sit down and eat, like, and we're going to talk. We're not going to watch TV. We're going to have conversation, whatever it is. You, you schedule it in, and you make time for it, because if you don't, someone or something else will take that time with something else. Prioritizing time and intimacy as a couple and with your family is important. If we don't do that, something else will come in and fill that slot up. So make time and prioritize it. So hey, you know what? Sunday fun day. That's what we're going to do on Sunday. We're going to have Monday madness. Two for Tuesday, Wild Thing Wednesday, Throw Down Thursday, Freaky Friday, whatever it is you want to call it. Make time and schedule it. And then actually prioritize it and do it. Couples so often, man, we just haven't had a date night in so long. Like, like this isn't just like one or two people. I mean, I'm talking about, about young couples and old couples and couples in between. We just haven't had a date night in so long. We haven't done anything together in so long. We just, we feel so separated and so distant and far from each other because we're not prioritizing and making time for it. And it's important that we do this because if we don't, hey, you don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to do anything. Date night at home. Sit down around a candle lit dinner in your, in your dining room and just eat and talk. Light a candle. Put on a little Whitney Houston or whatever it is you want. And make time for one another. I know particularly for some of us, kids are kind of young. And so we, I'm already laughing because I know where I'm going. <laughs> kids are kind of young. And so we're, we, we struggle with that time. And we're, we're struggling to make time for one another because the kids aren't sleeping on a regular schedule. They're waking up every couple of hours in the middle of the night or whatever it is. And we struggle with that. Make time in between. Maybe you can't even afford a sitter. And so because you can't afford a sitter, you're going, man, where, where are we going to get time? I'm not even going to do this because I'm, I'm already laughing. I know where I'm going. I'm just not, not going to go there. Some of you know where I'm going too. But just... Make time for it. Make time for it, seriously. And watch how that changes your relationship. Number three, when you want something, when you want something different, be it. This is important. Stop griping, stop complaining. Stop, stop, stop doing all these things about what your spouse is not and allow the Holy Spirit to transform you and transform your life. You know, one of the, the reasons why so many relationships struggle is because, the, not, not so much because the relationship itself is bad, but because the people that are in the relationship feel broken and hurt and are struggling themselves. Like, like we just, we're on different pages sometimes we feel like. And because we're in, in that direction, because we, we feel that broken, because we feel that, that separation, you know, maybe one person is just having a really hard time, and we feel that, and rather than drawing near to them, we, we pull away because we go, well, why are they acting so different? Why are they being so different? And, and if we want something different in our relationships, then we need to be it. You know, every time I feel like, you know, 
I wish something was different about Emily. I wish something was different with Emily. Why, why is she acting this way? Why is she doing that? Anytime I, anytime I feel that way, there's always at least three things in me that I need to allow the Holy Spirit to work on in me. There, there's always things in my life that even when I'm looking at, at her and I'm thinking, man, there's just, there's just something I need to be different here. There's, I need her to change her attitude. I need her to fix her, 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 her behavior. I need her to fix this, that, or the other thing. There's always something in me that I need God to work on in me. And one of the things that, that I, I've learned over the years of our marriage has been that as I point out things in my mind and go, well, why did she do that? Then I need to stop and check myself first. Because it's always easy to point the finger at someone else rather than recognize in yourself the things that need to be changed. If you want something different, be it. Be it. It's important that we recognize that it's not just the other person who needs change. They may need change, but guess what? You are not Jesus, so you are not perfect, which means there's something in you that also needs changing. And it's easy to point out where someone else needs changing, but not always easy for us to recognize where we need change. And if we want something different, we need to be it. Men, we need to step up and step out and lead our families. Maybe that's church attendance. Maybe, maybe that's, as a matter of fact, let me say this, even on vacation. You know, when, when, when Emily and I go on vacation with the kids, a lot of times we go to church. Because I, I, and that's something that, that's important to, to us as a family because, not because we're the pastors, or no, no, because Jesus is important to us. And I'm not saying that we're beating down the door at every single service, but I'm saying that, that, that we make sure that we are there, and if we're not there, we make sure we take spiritual time as a family. Because that is important to us, to ensure that we recognize and that we spend time with the one who, who died for our sins, the one who is the carer of our souls, the one who made the sacrifice on the cross for us. If he did all that for us, we can take a few minutes on vacation and spend some time with him. That's important. Maybe that means joining a small group. Matter of fact, we got small group sign up going on right now. Joining a small group and saying, you know what, we're going to be a part of a small group. Maybe that means sending the kids to youth group or getting involved and serving in some way. Let me tell you something. If you want to break a child of selfishness, let me tell you how you break that. Get them to start serving people. Seriously. If you get them to get out of their little bubble and you get them to start serving others, it, it really helps to drive home that point of that selfishness is not good. If we get our kids to start serving and if we start serving together, that, that's important. I mean, can you imagine coming to church with your family and you start serving with your family? That all, all of you, parents and children, you're here and you're serving in some capacity. I mean, you walk through the door on Sunday morning, the husband's by the door, the wife's by the other door, and the children are by the, the, the entrance to the sanctuary. Good morning from the Ebanks family. Good to meet you this morning. Welcome to Agape. That'd be a blessing. Incredible blessing. What I'm saying is, is that, men, that's our responsibility to step up and step out and lead. And listen, our wives will help us. I'll tell you, I'm, I've not always been the most brilliant leader in our family. There are a lot of times, like, like, like when it came to prayer for our kids, my wife was the one who really, really began that with our kids. And she started praying with our kids. And, 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 and I'll tell you, a couple of weeks ago, we were in church and we were, doing, we were spending some time praying. And I, and I called Emily and the kids to come in because they were in the nursery doing some stuff. And I called them to come into the service on Wednesday night. And uh, the men were praying for the women and then the women were praying for the men. And, and, and right as we were getting ready to end, Elena looks up and says, Daddy, can I pray? And I said, sure, sweetheart, go ahead. And I'll tell you, every single person who was in service that night was blown away that Elena prayed. I mean, just, just blown away that, that at, at five years old, prayed the way that she prayed, praying about hurricanes and praying that God would help and all this stuff. And, and everybody's like, wow, that was not Andrew Ebanks. That was Emily. Because she taught our kids how to pray. Our wives will help us. It's not all on us. We're there together as a team. The Bible, the Bible says that, that, that that's what we are. 
a team. And we work time. Remember that our wives, women, your your moment, what you give them is what you get. And so if you don't like what you're getting, change what you're giving. If you don't like what you're reaping, change what you are sowing. And that's what we need to do is recognize this. And, And when it comes to our relationships, there's a beautiful scripture in the book of Revelation. Jesus is talking to the church in Ephesus in Revelation, seven letters to seven churches. In Revelation chapter 2, he's speaking to the church in Ephesus, and Jesus says to them this really profound statement. He says, remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. And while that's not a scripture about marriage, I think it's very applicable to our marriages because sometimes we want something different, but we want to do other things. We don't want to invest the time and the energy and the effort into our relationships with one another. And let me just tell you, if you want to get what you once had, thinking back to all the years of joy and happiness that you you used to have, then you've got to do what you once did. You know, I'll be honest with you, the best party I've ever been to in my entire life, and I've been to, to many, was my wedding reception. Some of you laugh because some of you were there. We had the best time at our wedding, at our wedding reception. We were dancing, we were laughing. I mean, we just had a grand time. And a few weeks ago, I did a wedding for some people, and Emily was there, and, and uh, she said to me, she said, let's go dance. I said, mm, let's go do what? She said, let's go dance. And I said, all right. Two left feet, two left feet. So we went on the dance floor, and we're there, and we're dancing, and we're, we're, we're just, I mean, there's other people. There, there weren't many people on the dance floor. We were one of the few people who, who were actually on the dance floor, and we're dancing. And then, you know, all of a sudden, just, there's just this moment where she's looking at me, and I'm looking at her. We're just staring in each other's face. We just start whispering to each other, you know, the, the things that couples whisper to one another just blessing each other, just, just loving on each other. And it was just this incredible moment of intimacy between us. It didn't matter who else was there. I mean, other people were sitting around watching us dance on the dance floor. It didn't matter who was around. It didn't matter what else was going on. We're just dancing and just talking and just sharing a moment of intimacy between us as a couple. If you want something different, then you need to be it. And if you want to have those moments like you, like you used to have, then maybe you need to start doing some of the things that you did at first, where, where you spent that time together and you did those things. So, so maybe you just need to go have some fun and go dancing. Maybe you just need to dance around the house. I can't tell you the number of times. I mean, there's, there's always a party in my house. If it ain't me and Emily, it's the kids. We're always just just at something, and there's always just this moment where we're just doing things together. And I don't say that because we have the most wonderful marriage on God's green earth. We don't. We got struggles just like everybody else. But what I'm saying is is that if you want better, then you've got to start investing a little differently than maybe you've been investing in order to get something different than what you've been getting. And as Jesus said here, for some of us, that means going back and doing what we did at first, when we first fell in love, when we first started going together, when we first started getting excited about this person and and, and getting phone calls and messages from them, and maybe in the beginning you used to send little texts and say, I love you. Maybe in the beginning you used to send a little message and say, I miss you, I can't wait to see you. And you used to get excited about the other person and now it's just kind of like, oh, going home, great. If you do what you did at first, if you repent and do the first works, It can change things. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you this morning for this message. I thank you for your word, and I thank you for your goodness, God. Lord, this morning, there's there's, there's so many of us here that, that that are married. There's so many of us, Father God. Some of us are here with our spouses. Some of us aren't. Some of us, Lord, are... are are just having difficulties right now in our relationships, not, not even necessarily on the brink of divorce, just, just, Lord, things aren't where we want them to be. Not necessarily on the brink of breaking up, or maybe we are. But, but God, we, we, we want things to be better. 
We want to grow in relationship. And Lord, I recognize this morning that, that there's some here who, who Lord, they're, they're still waiting on, on someone in their life to have that relationship with. And Lord, we just, we, just, we just come before you this morning and lift up each person here today. And Lord, you see where our relationship needs are. And we just ask, Father God, would you work amidst all the different circumstances for the couple who's struggling, for the couple who's even this morning, Lord, at war with one another, for the couple, Father God, who's, who's not sure where to turn or what to do because, because things are just so hard right now. The couple, Lord, who, who financially just doesn't know how they're going to make it because, because right now things are just hard. For the couple, Father God, today who, who Lord, they, 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 they've been in disagreement and arguing for so long. They don't know how to talk to each other any differently. Father God, you see and you know all this morning. And God, I just pray and I ask in Jesus' name, would your spirit come and rest on us? And Lord, bring healing where healing needs to happen. Cause change where change needs to happen. That you would transform us to be different, to be loving, to be kind, to be encouraging, to be, to be one Lord who, who maybe hasn't said much in years, who Lord maybe hasn't even so much as, as even said a nice word to our spouse, but Lord help us today to make that change, to be the change that we want to see in our spouse. Help us to make the first step today, Father God. And Lord, where there's been, there's been fear to make the change, Lord, that you would cause your spirit to lead us through those choppy waters, to lead us on those rocky roads, Lord. That, Lord, that, that, that the healing might take place in our marriages. Lord, for those single this morning and, and waiting for, for that spouse, I just pray right now in Jesus' name that, Lord, that first of all, you would grant them the patience, even though it may have been a long time that they've been waiting, that they would have the patience to wait on the right one. But Lord, that also that, that Lord, that you would bring men or women into their life, that Father God would be someone that they would be able to spend the rest of their life with. Lord, I thank you that there's nothing wrong with being single. I thank you for that. And if you're here today and you're just like, what's wrong with me? Why am I still single? I'm here to tell you by the word of the Lord, there is not a thing that is wrong with you today. Marriage doesn't complete you. So Lord, help them right now to, to see their value and their worth in you. And to know, Father God, who you've made them to be. They live in the identity that you've created for them all the days of their life, God, and know that it is really you, Jesus, who completes us, married or unmarried. So, Lord, I ask right now in Jesus, transform each of us today, Lord, and bring healing and hope and deliverance so that we might be changed and that our relationships would flourish into the beauty of what you've created them to be. And I thank you and I praise you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen.